I'd like to quickly go over this model of the kidney and the glomerulus in the renal corpuscle there. Here we see a model of the kidney. We can see blood vessels entering and exiting through the renal hilus. This is the renal artery and it's leading to uh, segmented arteries which then leads to lobar arteries which then leads to interlobar arteries which leads to arcuate arteries which leads to these cortical radiants but some textbooks call them interlobular arteries moving over here we're seeing an arcuate artery leading to an, a cortical radiant artery and you can see that now we have smaller arterioles leading to these capillaries called a glomerulus. So here is a larger magnification of those structures. Here we see the afferent arteriole, and here we see the glomerulus. And on this outward part here, this is the efferent arteriole, and it has a smaller radius than the afferent arteriole and this helps to increase the hydrostatic pressure inside the glomerulus which favors filtration. And the glomerulus has a high number of filtration pores or slits and these are partly, um, these are formed by the podocytes but there are also fenestrations within the capillary bed itself. So these little cells right here are representing the podocytes that wrap themselves around and they have little feet-like extensions called pedicils and the slits in between them are the filtration slits. Here we have the glomerular capsule and together the glomerulus with the capsule create the renal corpuscle. Over here you're seeing the functional contact of the early distal convoluted tubule with the macula densa cells inside and just to remind you from lecture, they are monitoring the amount of sodium chloride. The filtrate at this point is very hypoosmotic, but if it gets too hypoosmotic, then these cells will stop releasing a chemical signal known as adenosine, and this will cause the afferent arterial to vasodilate, and then there will be more GFR, and hopefully restore the amount of sodium chloride that ultimately will reach the early distal convoluted tubule. Down here we're seeing the beginning of the proximal convoluted tubule and you can see the epithelium is simple cuboidal but the epithelium of the glomerular capsule is simple squamous. Going back over here you're seeing these structures are the renal pyramids and this renal cortex, there are parts of it that actually extend deeper toward the medulla and that's called a renal column. And the renal columns plus the pyramid re, um, is, a, is a lobe. So here we're looking at a kidney that would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lobes to it. The renal pyramids have their apex, which is called a papilla. So the renal papillae is where the urine is going to drip out into a minor calyx, and many minor calyces merge to form a major calyx, and then the major calyces merge to form the renal pelvis, which will then extend out of the kidney and turn into the ureter. We also see some veins here. We've got the cortical radiant veins. We have the arcuate vein, interlobar veins, and then we ultimately end up with the renal vein. There is no lobar vein and there is no segmental vein. Over here, you can see that there are there is a nephron that is not extending very deeply into the inner regions of the medulla. So this is a cortical nephron, and most of our nephrons are of that type. This nephron, which has a very long loop of Henle getting into the inner regions of the medulla, is a juxtamedullary nephron. Now again, we can see the renal um, corpuscle, so this is the glomerular capsule, and there is a glomerulus inside. Over here, they're showing you the glomeruli out of the renal um, glomerular capsule. So this part of the nephron is the 
proximal convoluted tubule. Most water and electrolytes, all glucose and all amino acids would be reabsorbed at this point in a normal healthy individual. So about 65% of the water that was filtered is reabsorbed here. 67% of the salts reabsorbed here. We had the descending limb of the loop of Henle or nephron loop. We had the hairpin turn and the filtrate at this point is as maximally hyperosmotic as possible. The ascending limb, we are going to have um, a thin ascending limb and a thick. We just want you to know it as the ascending limb. And the descending limb, we have water reabsorption, but we also have sodium and urea secretion. On the ascending limb, there is no water reabsorption, but there is a protein transporter that will reabsorb more sodium, potassium, and chloride, just to name a few electrolytes that are reabsorbed. There are others. Then coming up here, this is going to be the distal convoluted tubule. Now this one right here actually shows us the early distal convoluted tubule, and I know that because it's a functional contact with the glomerulus where those macula densa cells would be. And then continuing on over here would be the late distal convoluted tubule. And I'll remind you that this will be the target for aldosterone. And then we are going to have collecting ducts and medullary ducts and papillary ducts. And for my purpose, my lecture exam, I want you to remember that it's the medullary duct cells that are targeted for ADH. Okay, that's enough for this model. Oh, sorry, one more thing. These right here are representing the peritubular capillary bed, and these long capillaries here are representing the basa recta.